This is CBN News Watch. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm Ephraim Graham. Ahead today, the invasion begins as Vladimir Putin sends Russian forces into Ukraine. We'll have a look at his deadly attack. The Centers for Disease Control taking criticism for withholding information on COVID during the pandemic. Plus, Big Brother was secretly watching at least one university. The university said that it was meant to kind of track movement around campus, building use, kind of a heat map of where students um, were. Then later, we'll explore recent discovery of hundreds of unmarked graves at an Indian boarding school in Canada, prompting a national investigation. A lot of them died. Some of them probably died from broken hearts, and a lot of them just died from being in close contact with disease that they couldn't get rid of because everybody was crammed in together. All these stories and more coming up next in the CBN Newsroom. This is CBN News Watch. We begin with the long-expected Russian invasion of Ukraine with Russian President Vladimir Putin saying he will stop anyone who tries to interfere. The White House will not send troops into Ukraine even to rescue Americans. But U.S. troops are on the border with Poland and ready to help those fleeing from Ukraine. Brody Carter has our report. War sirens wailing in Kyiv before dawn, followed by early morning explosions in Kharkiv, Ukraine's second largest city. Explosions are reported in Kyiv and other cities across Ukraine. The bombing sent Ukrainians scrambling for safety. These scenes were from the port city of Mariupol. People lining up at ATMs and packing up their cars. In Kyiv, the capital, traffic backing up as far as the eye can see. Overnight, President Putin announced the beginning of Russian military operations in Ukraine, disguising his full-scale invasion as a mission to support Russian rebels in the Donbass region of Luhansk and Donetsk, land he claims belongs to Russia. Now a doorway for Russian troops into Ukrainian territory. It won't be bloodless. Uh, there will be suffering, there will be sacrifice. Ukraine's foreign ministry says they've landed in the southern port of Odessa, crossing into Kharkiv. This security footage shows Russian military crossing into Ukraine from Crimea, the peninsula seized by Russia in 2014. Ukrainian forces are fighting back in Donbass, as well as regions in the north and south. Dozens of soldiers reported dead so far, as well as civilian casualties. President Zelensky calling on Ukrainians to rise up and fight the invaders in the cities and town squares encouraging citizens to take up arms. The country's UN ambassador delivering this message to Russia at last night's Security Council meeting. There is no purgatory for war criminals. They go straight to hell, Ambassador. Meanwhile, the world community is responding with promise of sanctions, but no military aid. We are banding together in strong terms to condemn these outrageous acts in the strongest possible terms. President Biden issuing a statement last night saying, quote, Russia alone is responsible for the death and destruction this attack will bring. And the United States and its allies and partners will respond in a united and decisive way. The world will hold Russia accountable. The president is expected to address the nation at noon today and announce crippling economic sanctions against Russia. Brody Carter, CBN News. And CBN's George Thomas joins us now from Lviv, Ukraine. So, George, how are people there reacting to this invasion? Yeah, I woke up early this morning and hit the streets of Lviv, and there were long lines uh, from at grocery stores, pharmacies, uh, banks, you name it. Uh, people were scurrying. Some were walking very fast. Others were running, and just the sheer uh, shock and panic and fear. You could see it. I could see it. Uh, they were always on their phone. So clearly, the, the city is preparing uh, for what could potentially come in the hours and days ahead. Will other countries get involved now? Well, I, I mean, I think there is a big concern that uh, Belarus, Ukraine's neighbor to the north, uh, could get involved. As you know, uh, Ephraim, uh, there's been uh, probably about 35, uh, 35 to 38,000 Russian troops that have been staging there for several weeks. And, and uh, 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 Belarus's president, Lukashenko, 
uh, basically said that he would offer his uh, his army, which is about 48,000 in strength, uh, to the Russians if they needed. And there are some reports that uh, early this morning when Russian troops uh, uh, crossed the border from Belarus into Russia, that Belarus, uh, members of the Belarus army joined the Russians as well. So the big concern is that, uh, you know, one way to take the entire uh, uh, nation of Ukraine, rem remember this is the largest country in Europe next to Russia, uh, is to involve the uh, Belarus army and they could come in uh, from the western side uh, of the country. That is a very, very serious uh, uh, problem and one that we have not up to date uh, figured into our calculation when it comes to the troop strength uh, of the Russians. I know things are just beginning, but how long is this war expected to last? Uh, I mean, look, it, there are indications like, for example, just about a, an hour ago, one of the major military bases uh, just southeast of Kiev, the capital city, uh, was taken by the Russians. Uh, uh, that, that's about 15 minutes uh, from downtown Kiev. Uh, there, is, there, there are reports that they're coming in from the south, crossing the Crimean Bridge. There are reports that they're coming in from the north, basically just rolling their tanks. Uh, and troops right across the borders, the north, the east, as well as the south. Who knows how long this is going to take? Uh, but I can tell you that uh, Ukrainians are ready to fight, especially in the east. The big concern, uh, Ephraim, is that the majority of Ukrainian troops are uh, located in the south, uh, southeastern part of the country where all of this fighting has been going on for the last eight years. That leaves pretty much the rest of the country very vulnerable. My assessment that in the next couple of days, the main focus for the Russians is to divide Ukraine in, in half. Basically, the Dnieper River, which is the fourth largest river in Europe, runs through the very heart of, uh, of Ukraine. And the, and, uh, the sense is that Russia will, in essence, divide the country in half, take everything east of, of Kyiv and, and control it, at least for now. All right. Thank you so much, George Thomas, for your reporting. We appreciate your insight. Back here at home, the Centers for Disease Control is facing criticism for withholding information about the COVID pandemic. A spokesperson for the agency told the New York Times the information wasn't, quote, ready for prime time. The Times investigation raises questions about what data was withheld and why. Alori Johnson is on this story. The investigation found the agency responsible for helping Americans weather the COVID pandemic has only provided a small amount of the vast data it's obtained. Areas of this withheld information include COVID hospitalizations, including age, race, and vaccination status. The efficacy of boosters among 18 to 49-year-olds, the group least likely to benefit from the shots, and COVID levels in wastewater systems in various U.S. communities. While the CDC has not yet responded to CBN News, a spokesperson told The Times in part that the information was not ready for prime time. The CDC's Kristen Nordland added the agency must ensure details are accurate and actionable. She also admitted concern the data might be misinterpreted, such as vaccines being ineffective. This is Terrible. I mean, this is bad news. Political analyst Nathan Gonzalez told CBN News Faith Nation this only adds to Americans' skepticism of government. Now that we're this far and we're two years into a pandemic uh, and we get this story from The New York Times, it just creates even more distrust. He sees one way the CDC can rebuild that trust, tell Americans the whole truth. Give out more information, but put it in proper context. Give people the tools to know how to use the information in order to make the best decision for their lives and for their family. Former FDA Commissioner Dr. Scott Gottlieb says the CDC essentially failed its objectives, communication and guidance. So we didn't have an organization capable of doing that. We sort of surmised that CDC would be up to that task, but it wasn't. He says the CDC has a reputation of being slow at processing and sharing data. We need a better capability to uh, gather and disseminate information in a real-time fashion. CDC really wasn't up to that challenge. Gottlieb says moving forward, the agency should present all relevant data. Consumers could look at it and say, okay, 
this is what I need to do. This is what the agency is telling me based on this evidence. So while the COVID-19 pandemic presented never before seen challenges to America's top health agency, critics say it should learn from its messaging mistakes and pivot before the next health emergency. Lori Johnson, CBN News. There is some good news in the fight against COVID-19. The makers of a new COVID vaccine are claiming 100% efficacy against severe disease and hospitalization. The drug manufacturers Sanofi and GSK say two doses are needed to receive 100% protection from COVID's worst outcomes. The European-based pharmaceutical company also says their new vaccine is 75% effective against moderate to severe disease. Sanofi GSK plans to submit the new shots for authorization in the United States and in Europe. Coming up. This university recently subjected students to a secret surveillance program, tracking their every move across campus. We're going to have more on this story coming up. Stay with us. Is Big Brother watching your every move on campus? He is in our nation's capital. On this week's episode of The Global Lane, campus reform editor-in-chief Glenn Glenn Cicillo says George Washington University students recently learned that they were subjected to a secret surveillance program last fall. Students at George Washington University recently learned after the fact that they had been subject to this kind of secret surveillance program that was tracking their movement across campus by use of the school's Wi-Fi system, which of course they have to connect to in order to actually do their schoolwork. Um, The university president did apologize after the fact, not really for the content of what the school's program was doing, but more so for not having informed the students beforehand. Most students though, or sorry, many students feel that this is too little too late. Um, you know, they've already been used as data points and tracked without their consent, and the apology doesn't necessarily change that. Well, now you've talked to the students. What are they saying about this? Do they even care? What's interesting about this is that students, um, students often don't know what their individual rights are. Universities often take advantage of this. At the Leadership Institute's campus reform, we have been reporting that this kind of slow chipping away at individual rights um, and the just the attitude toward individual rights on campus uh, for years. For example, at Clara University in California, we saw students encouraged to uh, kind of tattle on their peers for breaking COVID guidelines. University of Denver, um, students actually willingly downloaded an app that tracked them in a similar way um, in the name of uh, contact tracing. So uh, the point here is students are often quite willing to give up these freedoms because they're not accustomed yet to what their their individualism and individuality um, affords them. So really where George Washington University messed up here was by not telling students in the first place. So what are GWU administration officials saying about it? What what was their reasoning? So this um, this particular program at GWU, um, the university said that it was meant to kind of track movement around campus, building use, kind of a heat map of where students um, were were traveling across campus. The university president reassured that the data was only being analyzed um, on a group level with kind of um, various identifiers and said that although it had not been done so in this case, that the university very well could have tracked this and analyzed this data down to the individual level, meaning that it could have looked at where a particular student was moving about campus and why. I still don't understand why they would need to do that. What what were they trying to get at? Given universities' obsession with race, critical race theory, all these other sort of demographic things, I would be surprised if this data wasn't being used to find out where certain groups of races, different demographics were gathering on campus and, and to what degree. So what needs to be done, Celine? It's really a thing where parents um, and families have to make sure that we're fostering that sense of individuality, sense of individualism and and ownership over individual rights before the universities have a chance to kind of insert themselves in that vulnerable period. It's also no wonder that after four years or even more 
of this type of treatment by a university that then when students come out of these places, they're very willing to then accept the government as that next logical authority figure um, and very critical of those who choose not to do so. Okay, I guess it's all about uh, creating critical thinkers as well. Celine Sissio, Campus Reform Editor-in-Chief. Thank you, Celine, for sharing those insights. We appreciate it. Thank you. And you can watch The Global Lane on the CBN News Channel this evening at 8.30 Eastern Standard Time. You can also download the CBN News app and watch it on demand. Still ahead, we're going to explore the recent discovery of hundreds of unmarked graves in an Indian boarding school in Canada. Stay with us. Investigators discovered 200 unmarked graves last year in Canada at an Indian boarding school. The discovery prompted the United States Secretary of Interior to launch a national investigation. Mark Martin traveled to Montana to explore this tragedy that's an issue on both sides of the border. When he was a child, Blackfeet Nation member Wes Bremner attended the Cutbank Boarding School in northwestern Montana. As a second grader in the 60s, distance and harsh winters made it a necessity. The school environment proved harsh as well. Bremner says physical abuse started on day one when a staff member punched him. He thumped me right between the eyes and almost knocked me out. And I went against the wall, just kind of wobbly on my feet. and. Uh, he said, now you go to bed, and it was about this time of day. Brimner is just one of many students who say they endured harsh corporal punishment and demeaning verbal abuse at indigenous boarding schools. And some came forward years later with allegations of sexual abuse. We asked Brimner if that ever happened to him. If I was, I would take it to my grave. And why is that again? the past. It's not something you would, uh, it's nobody's business. The boarding school where Bremner attended is still operational today. He says it's better run and the abuse that took place when he was a student is unheard of. On the Flathead Reservation in Montana, indigenous boarding schools existed alongside St. Ignatius Mission. The Jesuit priest and pastor, Father Craig Hightower, says abuse happened at these schools as well. There was some sexual abuse, there's no question about it, um, and that's already been litigated in court. Uh, the majority of the abuses were uh, trying to take away their culture, uh, trying to assimilate them into the white world, uh, and the corporal punishment of the day. The, I mean, just the corporal punishment that was common at that time. All that is left of the original Ursuline Academy are the remains of this grotto that held a statue of Mary. Children ages preschool to high school gathered in a building that once stood on this property. Was it worse with the priests and the nuns? Maybe, maybe not, but that, those were the big controversies of, uh, of kids, you know, really being be beaten and things like that. Uh, unfortunately, that was part of the culture overall. According to the National Native American Boarding School Healing Coalition, more than 350 U.S. government-funded and many times church-run boarding schools operated in the 19th and 20th centuries. The movement started under the Indian Civilization Act of 1819 with the goal of assimilating indigenous children. Bremner says his mother was one of thousands of kids taken from their communities. He says at her school, there was a sign that read, kill the culture, save the child. Montana State Representative Sharon Stewart Paragoy says while Crow tribe children weren't forcibly taken, the goal remained the same. Children weren't allowed to speak the language. Um, that was, and um, part of it was the hair was cut, especially with the boys uh, and the girls, their, their hair was cut. And then they were forced to move into the the modern dress. The 2021 discovery of more than 200 unmarked graves at an Indian boarding school in Canada led Deb Holland, the U.S. Secretary of the Interior, to launch a national investigation, the Federal Indian Boarding School Initiative. Holland, the first Native American cabinet secretary, says her eight-year-old grandparents were taken from their families. She hopes the investigation will shed light on the unspoken traumas of the past. A lot of them died 
Some of them probably died from broken hearts, and a lot of them just died from being in close contact with disease that they couldn't get rid of because everybody was crammed in together. And so what we want for our children is to help them to get to reconnect to who they are and to be strong and, and to have thriving nations. That's what we hope um, Deb Howland will be able to do, is to change the policy, educational policy, to provide empowerment. It's no strange thing for Native American communities not to trust the government, but um, to, to be able to create and to heal bonds within Native American communities and county governments, state governments, and the federal government and um, to have that conversation so that we can move forward. Mark Martin, CBN News, Montana. In our On the Home Front segment this week, we head to Holloman Air Force Base in New Mexico, where engineers explain why diversity and Black History Month is so important. Diversity is the backbone of the Air Force. Without diversity, we're stagnant. And no one needs a stagnant Air Force. We keep on pushing, we gotta keep on moving, and we gotta blend in with the mindsets of everyone else to reach the common goal. It allows people to approach a situation that everyone's you know, looking at from a completely different perspective. What African American History Month means to me is celebrating the accomplishments of black African Americans in the United States and around the country. African American History Month is extremely important, extremely beneficial, extremely knowledgeable for anyone that needs that extra edge on what we did as Americans, African Americans, to help build America. When it comes to black history, not only does it, you know, not only is it my history, you know, as an African American, but it's all our histories. It, it's intertwined in everything that we do as individuals, as America. Time now for your Thursday Thankful. I hope you'll join me in this prayer of gratitude. Heavenly Father, thank you for a love that flows beyond my comprehension. It's deeper than any river. It's higher than any mountain and wider than any ocean. Thank you and amen. With this prayer of gratitude, I pray you will make today, Thursday, a Thursday filled with thanksgiving. That is going to do it for this edition of CBN News Watch. Thank you so much for your company. Remember, you can always find more of our programs on the CBN News Channel. You can find them there anytime as well as online at CBNNews.com. Take a moment. Let us know what you think about the stories you've seen here today. You can email us, newswatch at CBN.com. You can also reach out and touch us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. We'll see you back here tomorrow. Thanks for watching.